13. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now, over the last weeks I have been trying to show, and I have yet some sermons left, some quiver, arrows left in my quiver, on how to get out of the religious rut. And I've tried to show that most Christians are in a religious rut. Now, you heard me when I said that, and I am not backing out nor modifying it. Most Christians, most evangelical Christians, most Christians who know they've been born again are nevertheless in religious rut. And because Christians are, therefore, churches which are made up of Christians are also in the religious rut. Now, that is a premise. I, I, I state that and don't apologize for it, nor in any wise modify it. And I've tried to show why we're in a religious rut. And I've tried to show that we must get out of it and how. Now tonight, I have read two texts in your hearing, or really two texts, so they're from one passage of Scripture. And the Holy Ghost in this Scripture says two things. God works in you to will, but that end you are to work with God in working it out. Now there are the two passages. It is God who worketh in you to will. Therefore, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. God works in you. That is, God is always previous. God is the aggressor. Uh, God saw you in the rut and wanted you to get out of it, and he thought of it first, not you. And the impulse to know God came from him and not from you. God worketh first. And because God works, Therefore, we are to work with him. You are, therefore, to dismiss all doubts and all morbid humility. You see, it's entirely possible to be so humble uh, in a sick kind of uh, way that you paralyze yourself and get nowhere. For instance, you say to yourself, now that man has been preaching about getting out of the religious rut. And while I haven't agreed with everything he said, I have been feeling that I am in a rut and that I ought to get out. This circular grave is getting deeper every year in my life, and I can hardly see over it. Give me four or five more years, and you, you look right over me and won't know I'm there. I need help. But I am wondering whether God will help me or not. And that is morbid humility, you see. Because if we knew the truth, we'd know that you had gone right on around in that circular grave until you'd worn your way down to China and never thought of getting out of it at all. The very fact that you want out of it is the proof that God has been working in you to will to get out. And if God works in you to want to get out, then when you ask him to get out, do you suppose that he won't help you out? Would God put an impulse in your breast and then refuse to, to accept your prayer when you came in answer to that impulse? Would a mother bring a hungry baby to the table and prepare its food 
And then when it let out its happy little yell and stretched out its hands, pull it away, and say, you're no good, you've never done anything anyhow, you're no... Now, if you, you grant the baby, grant the baby your intelligence, if it is intelligent, grant the baby your intelligence, and here's the way the baby would act. Or what it would say to itself. The baby would say, I am now eight months old, and I haven't helped my mother at all, and I've been bad sometimes. I've kept her up at night, and even daddy had to get out once or twice. And I obviously am no good. I'm not making any contribution to society. I'm just no place. Now, why should I think that mother is going to feed me? But mother, in the meantime, is begging him to eat. And he says there's no use. Now, that would be morbid humility. Of course, no baby would have that much intelligence. It would just grab for what was in front of it, which is exactly what God wants you to do. If, uh, if God hadn't put it in your heart to want his blessing, you wouldn't have wanted it. You'd have been down here seeing the Toronto football team get clobbered today. You wouldn't even been here tonight. You'd been home resting up from the excitement. You wouldn't even been here. But the uh, fact that you're here and the fact that you're ready to listen to this kind of preaching indicates that God has been previous in your life. Therefore, you must work with him in harmonious cooperation so that God can work in you and for you and through you. You know, the word fanatic is the word that people use whenever you get a little bit, uh, you know, joyful about the Lord, they say you're a fanatic. Webster says a fanatic is somebody who is too enthusiastic about religion as if you could be too enthusiastic about religion. And John Wesley, while he was not a philologist, he was a theologian, and he said that a fanatic is one who seeks desirable ends but ignores constituted means. Let me illustrate for you. Here's a farmer boy with his blue jeans and his torn shirt and his tattered uh, straw hat. Wants to get a fish. His mother says, why don't you go down and catch a couple of trout, son? So he goes down for the, the, the beautiful day, the sun's shining, uh, and, and, and the cows are standing deep in the water and in the, in the shade trees, under the shade trees, and it's just a lovely day. And so he pulls off a stalk of grass and begins to nibble it, as I've done, I guess, 100,000 times when I was on the farm, and uh, begins to wonder about those fish. And he says, now, uh, I, uh, I remember the pastor said, if we want anything, pray for it. And in the meantime, the fish were breaking the surface, begging to be caught. There they were. And he said, I remember that the pastor said, pray for it. So he turns over often where he was lying so easy on the grass and begins to pray like a house on fire, Lord, send me some fish. Well, he can pray till he dies and he'll never have any fish because the Lord put intelligence in his head and gave him what we call the constituted means. And for the farm boy, and I've done it many times, you take a stick which you cut off of the tree, you take an ordinary piece of cord you can get anywhere, and you put a bent pin on the end if you don't have the nickel to get the, the hook and you throw it in with a worm on it, and the fish will take it. Fish are so dumb in the country, they'll take it. Now, here, here is what, here's what I mean. Would the thing be for the boy to be very pious and pray for a mess of fish, or throw in his hook and pull out a mess of fish? Why, everybody knows that you go down and hear a loud voice addressing the Almighty God, and you get near to him, and he was a country boy praying for fish, with fish breaking the surface, begging to be caught, you'd go away and say something wrong there. Of course, he's a fanatic. He is trying to get a desirable end, but he's ignoring the constituted means. Now, I suppose his father, who also attended the church, where he had this very fine pastor who tells them they pray, they'll get what they prayed for. And he wants potatoes in springtime. And he says, I'd like to have a good, uh, good field of potatoes this year. I really need them. And uh, so he gets down on his knees, and every day he spends praying for potatoes while it gets too late to plant potatoes. And the potatoes down in the basement waiting to be cut and planted, uh, 
uh, are, are stretching out their long roots toward the sunlight, and all their begging is for him to use the constituted means, plow the field, get it in shape, cut his potatoes, and plant them. Go around occasionally and keep the wheat down and come back in the fall and take out a great crop. Constituted means, you see. Or suppose that the lady of the house, I don't know why I picked on the country tonight, but suppose the lady of the house wants some duck. She just has a yen for a hat full of ducklings. She loves a little yellow fella, she said. She wants some ducklings. So down on her knees she gets and prays for ducks day and night. He's not using the constituted means. The way you get ducks is to get fertile duck eggs and put them under a hen. Four weeks, they're out. If they're chickens, they're out in three weeks. But if they're ducks, they're out in four weeks. Duck comes slower. And so four weeks, the ducks are out. The way to get ducks is to get duck eggs and set them. Now, I've gone way around Robin Hood's red barn. To illustrate what a fanatic is. A fanatic is somebody who is seeking desirable ends but ignoring constituted means. Seeking to get out of the religious rut is a desirable end. It is right and it is in the will of God. But trying to do it in a manner which is not according to God's constituted means is all wrong and we never get anywhere. Some try, when they want to get blessed, they try by getting worked up psychologically. They work it up by psychological means. And there are some men who are, are maybe they've not studied psychology, but they're master psychologists. And they know how to manipulate audiences. And they know just how to lower the voice and when to raise it and when to make, this, make it sound uh, very sad and all the rest. And uh, they can just get people all worked up. I sat listening to a fellow one time, and right across Caddy Corner from me was a young woman, maybe 22 or 3 years old. Nice looking lady. She sat there. I know, and the only reason I noticed her at all was she had in glass shoes. You ever see them? Or maybe they were plastic. But anyway, I noticed a funny shoe sticking out in the eye. And this fellow went on preaching, and he never, as far as I remember, said anything about the Lord, but he told us all about his father and his mother and his father leaving home and the whole thing. When I watched this lady idly, and as I would watch him and look at her, and she, at first she didn't, couldn't have cared less. But slowly he got hold of her, and when he came to the point where the evangelist said in a tremulous voice that every time he faced an audience, he hoped that his old father might be there. Well, the girl broke down, went to pieces, you know, and I saw from that time she was eating out of his hand. He knew how to handle her psychologically, and he got her, all right. He'd have done anything for her. You don't know that, evangelist, I'm sure. It wasn't Billy Graham, God bless you, so don't get mad and go out and storm out until I'll never come back. Billy Graham wouldn't stoop to that. But some do. Now, some try by group dynamics. Have you heard about group dynamics? We all sit around together and practice together in this. And by practicing together in this, we finally work up some spirituality. Brother and sister, I remember sitting around a table when I was a kid. My aunt, Adeline, Addie they called her, Aunt Addie, she weighed, oh, roughly speaking, uh, 200 210, and she was a lovely soul and sweet, but she came with the idea that uh, if you would put your hands together around the table, that you could tip the table. And I put my patties down there around my mother and some others, my Aunt Addie, and bless my heart, it tipped all right. There's no question about it. I'm not fooling. It tipped. It tipped, and, and then somebody said, sit on it. Somebody sat on it, and they couldn't move it. It tipped. We were practicing together in it. You see, uh, togetherness. We used to have Ouija boards, and if you got around uh, togetherness. Brothers and sisters, uh, sometimes I, I wonder where they're going to lead us yet. We need some old-fashioned, salty horse sense. And I'm sure that there are 189 mules in the, in the state of Missouri that have got more sense than a lot of these fellows who are trying to teach 
how to get the blessing of God in some other way than the constituted means. And when you do get people all broken up, dabbing at their eyes and shaking, when you do, what's the result? Well, it doesn't bring us any closer to God. It doesn't make us love God any better, which is the first commandment. And it doesn't give us any greater love for our neighbor, which is the second commandment. And it doesn't prepare us to live fruitfully on earth, which is most important. And it doesn't prepare us to die victoriously. And it doesn't guarantee that we'll be with our Lord at the last. The Lord has constituted me. Now, a little late, but I, I'm going to just touch it. Listen, our Lord said in the, the 50, 14th chapter of John, He that has my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Now, anybody can understand that, even the teacher of group dynamics. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our boat with him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my things, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. Now what our Lord taught there was this. Our Lord taught that... Uh, when we obey the words of Jesus in faith and in love, when we obey the words of Jesus, we prove that we love him, and he shows himself to us. There are two subjects acting here, we and he. When we obey his word, we prove that we love him, and he shows himself to us. But who is this he that I'm talking about? Jesus Christ, our Lord. The divinely constituted means then are two. Faith, a right kind of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and obedience to his word. Now faith in our Lord Jesus, we believe in God, said Jesus, believe also in me. Now faith in Jesus Christ, the right kind of faith, the only kind of faith that, that, that matters, is irrevocable, total commitment to the person of Jesus Christ himself. Total commitment, which is irrevocable. That is, you can't go back on it. And it is total, and there's nothing that isn't included. So faith in Jesus, then, is not gulping twice and saying, I accept Jesus. It is getting into a state where you have totally committed yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith. Now, not to your denomination. I don't mind telling you plainly, I don't mind telling you that I wouldn't spend five minutes trying to persuade you people that the Christian and Missionary Alliance is the greatest, the greatest uh, society in the world. I wouldn't. And if I thought that I would make a denominationalist out of you or a sectarian so that you'd get the notion that outside of the Alliance people are second-class Christians, I'd quit now. I wouldn't, I wouldn't carry on. Faith is not commitment to your denomination. It is a revocable commitment to the person of Jesus Christ. And it is not commitment to your church. I believe in the local church. I, I'm not a tabernacle man. I believe in the local church. I believe in the divine assembly. And I believe that we ought, as a group, realize that we are, as Christians, a divine assembly, a cell in the body of Christ, alive with his life. But for one second, would I not for one second would I try to create in you a faith that would lead you to commit yourself irrevocably to a local church, nor to your church leaders. I complained one time to a great and good man that I couldn't make followers. I said, I don't know, people won't follow me. He said, you ought to thank God. He said, you're not up there to get people to follow you. You're up there to present the Lord Jesus Christ and ask them to follow him. So you're not asked to follow your church leaders. You're not asked like a little robin on the nest to open your blessed innocent little mouth and just take anything I put in. 
If what I put in isn't biblical food, regurgitate. Don't be afraid to do it. Call me or come to see me. Or write me in an anonymous letter. If you write me an anonymous letter, you won't get an answer. Remember that. But do something about it. Don't by any means swallow what your leaders give you. Here's the book. Here's the Bible. Go to it. So faith is faith in Jesus Christ, God's Son. A total faith in Christ and not in the denomination or the church. Though you love the church and you respect and love your leaders and you're glad to work along with an evangelical denomination. But your commitment is to Christ. Now... That's faith. Then the obedience we talked about. We prove we love him and he shows himself to us. But you say there are so many commandments, so many words. How do I know? How can I remember? And how can I be sure? Well, in faith and love you rest and wait and look. And then as his teaching touches your life, you conform to them. You see, there are some teachings of the Lord Jesus that you'd never get into while the world sang, because they would, wouldn't touch you. It wouldn't impinge upon you in your present uh, state. But as soon as it does touch you, then you just automatically and sweetly and quietly obey it. The man was telling about uh, giving a testimony to being uh, shipwrecked and praying, and the Lord delivered him from shipwreck. And a dear old man of God, dear young man of God, then went home and uh, went on his knees and wept before the Lord. Oh, God, he said, you never saved me from shipwreck. And the Lord said, son, have you ever been at sea? And he said, no. Of course, you can't save a man from shipwreck who's never been off the shore. And so there are things that don't touch you. But the moment they touch you, instantly, of course, right then, for instance, there's, there's a what to do with your children. If you don't have any children, don't worry. Husbands obey, well, I mean, wives obey your husband. All right. If you don't have any husband, why worry about that one? But if wherever the words of our Lord Jesus touch your life, instantly, because you're totally committed, you gladly and quietly obey and you do what you're told. He says that's your part. His part is to manifest himself to you. Get you out of the rut. Now, I want to give you some examples. And you can now be very brief about it because it's already late enough. But listen, in the meantime, when they were gathered together, an innumerable company of people, they came to Jesus, and Jesus said to them, verse 2, 12, Luke, For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and whatever is spoken in the air, and cause it shall be proclaimed upon the housetop. Now, what that teaches us is we are to be as candid and transparent as can be. No secretiveness. Uh, no defensiveness. But be completely open and candid as a quake. Now, that's the teaching of Jesus. And so instead of getting down on your knees and saying, Oh, Lord, get me these fish. Catch some fish, brother. Obey the Lord. Do what you're told. Use the constituted means. Be candid. Put away that carefully cultivated North American defensiveness. Don't be so afraid. You're not so bad. And uh, you don't have to be afraid to let people know who you are and what you are. Let down your hair, so to speak. When I use that expression, of course, I use it in a modified sense about myself. But uh, let down your hair and uh, just be yourself. The Lord said, be children. We just all become children here. How beautiful it would be. You wouldn't walk up on the defense and shake a man's hand that blinks like this, wondering now, <coughs> do I know Judo well enough to handle him? He's not going to hurt you. Christians here aren't going to hurt anybody. So just be perfectly candid. Now, there's one passage. You can practice that no matter who you are, no worry. That touches you right now. Then look at this one. I say unto you, be not afraid of them that kill the body. After that, I have no more they can do, but I'll fall on you whom you shall fear. Fear him that's able to kill the uh, body and soul in hell. Now, here's your teaching. Don't be afraid in your Christian life. Put away fear and live absolutely without fear. Then go on to this passage. Whoever will confess me before men, him... Uh, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels, but he that denies me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. 
Here we have a passage that tells us that we are boldly to testify and witness to our Lord Jesus. If some of you would begin quietly to witness for your work, quietly to witness, you find the change coming over you. It says to do it here. He that hath my words and keepeth them, he loves me, and I'll show myself to him. You'll get out of the rut when the Lord begins to manifest himself to you. But you'd rather maybe go out somewhere, get down on, the, on your knees and pray. Now, praying is right. I've taught and preached and practiced praying since I was converted to the age of 17. But the point is, don't try to pray down something that the Lord's telling you to do. Do what you're told, and the Lord will be right with you. Then instead of begging, you can thank. Well, then in verse 15, take heed and beware of covetousness. He says, he gives a little story of the man who was a covetous man, and he lost his soul. So don't be covetous, be a generous man. Don't be stingy, be free with your money. Don't be afraid, thank the Lord and trust him and put fear away. And don't be afraid to witness, tell people you love the Lord and he'll tell the angels he loves you. Now, that's found in Luke. And uh, I just mention that as samples of what I mean when I say that the constituted means our faith and obedience. Now, we sing this and don't know we're singing it. We sing, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. We sing that, but we've sung it so long that we might as well sing Mother Goose Rhyme. Because we don't know what we're singing. What we're saying is what I've preached tonight. Have faith in Jesus Christ and obey his teachings and he'll take care of the rest. That's Christianity, brother. That's it. Now, if you're in the rut, and oh, brother, how far some of us are down in a spiritual rut. Old routine, old routine. Nothing has any taste to it. Some churches try to handle that by by pandering, pandering to the taste, they bring in every kind of weird claptrap in order to. Get some of the poor half dead people to get a little taste again. Oh, how my mother I used to get sick when I was a kid. Eat green apples, you know, or green grapes and get sick. I should have been. But mother didn't know that. She loved me, so she'd stay up with me all night while I'd go on with her stomachache. And then when I'd get better, I couldn't be no, no, I don't want anything to eat. That poor woman would tempt me with everything. She'd open a can of this, and she'd cook that, and she'd bring me balls. And I kind of enjoyed, you know, being a martyr. No, I'm not hungry, Mother. But she did everything to get me to eat. I should have if she'd known what she should have known. And Mother's love had, had been, if Mother's wisdom had been as great as her love, she'd have said, get a lie there to your off. I'd have come around after a while. But you know, the churches are just like that. Here, there's an old deacon, you know, and he's been on the same old circular grave so long he can't see over. So in order to get him out, you know, and get a grin on his face, they will bring in anything, anything from everywhere. I won't. And this church won't as long as I have anything to say in it. We have God. We have Christ. We have truth. We have a world needing help. We have the saints. We have the power of prayer. We have the joy of obedience. We have the sweet wonder of his presence. We have the joy of Christian song. We have all wisdom. We don't need God. We've got God. And all we have to do is trust in his son, Jesus Christ, and begin to obey the truth. And the Lord will manifest himself and show himself through the land. You'll come run to church someday and say, you're going to have a testimony to me tonight. I'm bursting. God's been met me today and blessed my soul. I don't think I can keep it. What happened? You fanatic? No. You used the constituted means to get a desirable end. You obeyed and you trusted, and whoever trusts and obeys, says the song, the Lord will be with you and bless you. Well, that's everything for me from me tonight. Pray for me. I preach every night at a conference. Down in out, out of New York City this week. Then, Lord, help me. I haven't any sense at all. I uh, promised a 
church here, Hyde Park, Hyde Park Baptist Church, on Saturday night I'd preach till then. And on Sunday I'd preach till I was here. And on Monday I'd go to another conference and preach some more. But I love it, and uh, when I'm not feeling very well, all I have to do is preach and I feel all right. So you pray for me, won't you? And we'll trust God together. And in the meantime, our good friend here will see it ahead of things. I said to somebody, boy, he not only doesn't need to be pushed, he pushes me. That's what I'm after. That's the kind of man my heart goes out to. So he'll be on tap, waiting to help you and pray with you. Not run your errands, but do any spiritual thing that you need. And when we come up to our wonderful convention, and we're having some of the finest speakers, this ought to be a great fall. I'm looking forward to it with all the keen delight myself. Brother McNally, would you lead us in a closing song? All right. <laughs>